Hello, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Um, I want to get right into it. We've got a lot of ground to cover in a fascinating panel. Meredith, I wanted to pose my first question to you. You um, have written a book called Artificial Intelligence, uh, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Uh, I, was, I, I was hoping that you could tell us about an experience you had of textbooks in Philly schools, just as an illustration of how computers do misunderstand the world. Well, so this was uh, this was a story that I wrote about uh, originally for the Atlantic. That a little ended site called the Atlantic, which I recommend to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my son was in first grade, and he and I, uh, and he came to me and he said, "I need help with my homework." And I said, "Sure, of course." I got very excited, and he said, "I need to write down natural resources." And I said, sure, oil, gas, and coal. And he said, no, those are not natural resources. And I said, what are you talking about? Of course they are. And so we get into an argument. And you don't really want to be in an argument with a first grader, right? You're just, you're not going to win. And I realized what I needed to tell him uh, in that moment was not what was right in the you know, right and wrong sense, but rather what was going to get him full credit on the assignment, which is how you do school. Right? Uh, so I said, let's look in the book. And he said, there is no book. I said, well, of course there's a book. There's always a book at school. And he said, well, there is a book, but we're not allowed to bring it home. And I thought, well, that seems crazy. So I started getting, uh, and you know, so then it took me like another two hours to try and like hack into the electronic textbook system, and that didn't work. And I was like, well, if I'm a professor and I'm having this much trouble helping my first grader with his homework, I'm really worried about the standardized tests that are gonna start in a couple of years. And then I looked at the Philadelphia public schools and I said, well, Philadelphia public schools can't get more than 50% of their students to pass the standardized tests. I, I wonder I, if I could do something about that. So I look into it, I learn that the same people write the books and write the tests. And there's a really easy way to pass the tests if you want to, you just read the book. Right? Like the answers are in there. But I wondered, do Philadelphia public schools have enough textbooks for the students to learn the material that's on the state mandated tests? So I asked the school district and they didn't know. I said, well, do you have a list of the books? And they said, yes. And I said, well, you know, if you give me a list of the books, I can reverse engineer, uh, you know, kind of adequacy index. And they were like, really? You can do that? And I was like, yes, yes, it can be done with a computer. Uh, but it turned out I had to build artificial intelligence software to do it, uh, which I did. And I discovered that, in fact, Philadelphia Public Schools only had about 27% on average of the books that the students would need in order to learn the material that's on the state-mandated standardized tests. And moreover, they didn't have enough money to buy the books that they would need. So it was... It was an investigative uh, story that was only achieved through using uh, technology, and it required like some pretty advanced technology. But it was an illustration of how, uh, when we kind of imagine, oh yeah, the the school of the future is going to just have laptops or is just going to have iPads. Actually, a book in the hands of a child is a very inexpensive and effective tool. So it made me think about technology differently. It made me think about, all right, let's use the right tool for the task as opposed to just using technology because we're like, yay, computers. Yeah. That's a really interesting story. Both, you know, some positive aspects of, of AI, some of the darker aspects of it or the things that need to be considered in using it. Edmund, I wanted to ask you, you have built this thing, the moral machine, uh, which is intended, as I understand it, to teach us something about ourselves. Tell us a little bit more about what it does. Uh, yeah, uh, so Moral Machine is uh, a website uh, that basically generates uh, random moral dilemmas that are faced by a driverless car. And uh, it asks you what you think the car should do in these moral dilemmas. And the kind of moral dilemmas that are featured are, mostly, are basically all, all uh, about like, a, a distribution of harm, like either you have to spare or save this group of people, which means killing the other group of people. Uh, now, the goal is basically to, uh, uh, there are two goals for this uh, website. Uh, one goal is uh, basically uh, promoting the public engagement, uh, trying to, uh, to see what people, uh, give people the platform to weigh in or like to discuss and uh, 
also like sometimes uh, we knew that it was being used in, in some classes by uh, some educators would just let students create dilemmas and then they start making discussions around these things. And these dilemmas yeah. are like the trolley problem yes, and yes, things like that, yes. right? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So like, for example, a driverless car is headed on the street and then uh, always the brake fails. Uh, and as in every story, uh, and then there's one group of uh, pedestrians in front of the car. If uh, if the car doesn't do anything, uh, it's gonna con it's gonna hit those pedestrians and kill them, or it could swerve into a barrier and kill pe uh, passengers. And then we vary different characteristics of those people. Uh, they could be like you know like uh, males, females, uh, uh, elderly, young. Uh, and this sort of thing. And this is also like, so the other goal is basically like a large scale uh, social, uh, sorry, psychology experiment. Uh, so in which we vary different uh, attributes and try to see uh, what factors would uh, change people's decisions about uh, who to spare. And who to save. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, you're kind of inferring from how many people have taken the, have used the moral machine? So we had, uh, we had uh, 4 million uh, over 4 million people visited the website, and they clicked on over 40 million uh, dilemmas. Um, so you're yeah. starting to uh, uh, acquire some, something of a rule set for human behavior in these fraught circumstances. Uh, I, would, I would say it's more like a, you know, mapping a picture of how uh, people uh, think or like what kind of biases are there in, in those societies. The other good thing is also we had people coming from different countries. Uh, we also translated the website to like nine other languages. So this way we could uh, also like uh, even like uh, identify some uh, broad cultural differences. One quick question for you before we, we jump off the moral machine. The action of clicking a button is a very different action than actually deciding whether who is going to die <laughs> in yeah. a lethal circumstance. Uh, do, do, do you have confidence that users would make the same decision in that type of laboratory environment that they might in the real world? Uh, I, I almost think that they would definitely have a different answer when they click the button versus when they're driving. Uh, but I think the goal is not to capture what people would have done when they are driving. I think the, the, the goal uh, in our case, I think this is an interesting question uh, in, in its own sake, but our goal is to understand what people think the car would do uh, when they are really comfortable and sitting uh, instead of as when they are uh, yeah. making a decision. Yeah. Laura, your company has a pretty, it's Altepica, right? Yeah. Um, has a pretty fascinating application of AI. Um, and it's especially fascinating for me right now in my capacity at the Atlantic, one of the things that I oversee is our talent lab, which is, among other things, responsible for a lot of our hiring, for overseeing our hiring and recruitment practices. Um, and so you help companies uh, use AI in their, um, apply it to their, their application pools and candidate pools and pipelines um, to try to surface the best candidates and to surface diverse talent where they might not otherwise yeah. have been able to find it. How do you do that? How, how do you take an applicant pool and find uh, things that a human might not find in it? So a lot of companies rely on self-reporting and we decided not to. So um, a couple years ago, I was on a panel at Stanford Law talking about the intersection of employment law and diversity in tech. And with, you know, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and leaders of Facebook and Google um, talking about diversity and everything was anecdotal and everything relied on self-reporting. And I said, what if we decided not to rely on self-reporting? Mm. So we took every sort of government information out there um, and aggregate um, resume, and we decided to predict race and gender, which would give much more of a mobility on in the applicant pool. Um, a lot of people were like, where are you lying this? Is this legal or not. So I got an angel investor who's an employment lawyer. I'm like, do you want to <laughs> invest? <laughs> so he did. And he's all like, this is the future. And because I was so adamant about um, inclusion in the data set was very different than every other um, sort of peer of mine that built faulty AI for other big tech companies that were biases that um, that allowed us to 
uh, sort of enhance our isms, whether it was sexism or racism. So I decided to start off uh, with a neutral data set. A lot of data scientists decided to say, well, you have to randomize to what you're um, looking at. And I said, no, how about if we didn't made equitable uh, training set, 50% female uh, resumes and 50% male res resumes for technical, for tech. Um, I've had a lot of ethical and moral debates around this. I think that when it reaches 50-50, maybe I will randomize there, <laughs> <laughs> not at the moment. Um, and so we decided to then patent the whole sort of men mentality and people and um, a lot of people are always like, is this something that we can use? And I said, well, you are targeted by Amazon and, every, and Facebook and Google. Why wouldn't you want to target your applicant pool to be more inclusive in a way that is thoughtful um, by a female founder? Mm. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes, our AI is really about predicting how the dynamics of the workforce will, will look like, not now, but in five or 10 years. So, so we tell them, I said, okay, you may not want to buy our product, but in 10 years, the workforce does not look like how you're currently hiring for. So you might as well predict it. Yeah. So Katie, you have one of the most uh, valuable perspectives because it's one of the only, you're one of the only high school students, I think, that is probably with us this morning. Uh, and AI is currently operating on so many aspects of, of the, your generation's life. Um, you went through a program called AI for All. What was that program and what did it do? Yeah, so it's a three-week summer program, and it was started at Stanford University in 2015, and now it's held at six different universities, and I went to the three-week summer program at BU. And the notion behind AI for All is just trying to increase the diversity in AI and also to educate the next generation on what AI actually is. Because oftentimes in schools, there aren't classes that are specified for in artificial intelligence. And in our everyday lives, I feel like at school, we don't talk about it that much. Yeah. And oftentimes people are using AI in their lives, but they don't even know it. So a lot of people like to use Snapchat. And every single time a filter pops up on your face, that's using artificial intelligence. Yeah. But most of the time, people don't even know that. So this program really helped introduce me to what AI actually is, and it's how it's more than just self-driving cars. Yeah. Now that you have had that immersion in um, how many ways AI is operating in all of these social contexts that you and your friends and classmates are using all the time, how do you feel about that when you use an app like Instagram, for example, and see the curated feed that it creates for you? Yeah, in some ways, it kind of makes me question why for instance, a post that was posted 20 minutes ago is coming up before something that was posted 10 minutes ago. So why is it cured that way? Is it because one person has more followers than the other? Or is it because Instagram knows that I like more of their pictures? And so I'm not necessarily sure why they show up the way they do, but that really interests me. And I think that a lot of people don't necessarily look into that very much and they just kind of scroll through their feed and they don't really think much of it. Yeah. I have a question for the room and for the panel. How many of you are excited about a future of fully autonomous vehicles? And how many of you are worried about a future of fully autonomous vehicles? <laughs> All right. My understanding is that you, Edmund, and you, Meredith, feel even slightly differently about this technology that we're about uh, to, to bring in. Ed Edmund, tell me a bit about your uh, enthusiasm for a world of autonomous vehicles. What do you imagine um, uh, are the, the positive effects of that world? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first thing is, I mean, they, they're going to come and uh, they're, they're promising with uh, a lot of benefits, uh, including uh, minimization of, uh, of accidents. And I think this is quite important that, you know, some experts have made calculations and they said 90% of accidents, uh, they're going to minimize 90% of accidents. Of course, other experts are doubtful about these numbers. But I think uh, uh, 
Rand corporations have have, done, have had the study recently, and uh, they said like you know if those cars uh, those cars could be minimizing uh, from the average uh, uh, person accident, uh, then is it is it uh, then okay to put them out on the street now, or should we wait until they become uh, near perfect? And they found that you know maybe if we wait until they become near like, that they minimize 100% of the accidents, uh, then by that time we would have lost a lot of a lot of lives. So maybe maybe we might want to, uh, from a utilitarian point of view, uh, it might be on the long run might minimize uh, more. Um, Death, for example. Uh, now, this is a still an ethical uh, decision, and the fact that it minimizes uh, uh, lives does not mean that that's like a, should be like a, an enough reason to deploy them uh, on the street. But I think this is one thing that is at least I feel optimistic about that you know there might, there will be some part of the job that they would do better than humans. I think. Yeah, Meredith, I wanted to ask you this question. I I, I posed you a version of the question. I would love you to tell me the answer that we didn't get to really to uh, to explore backstage. Um, you've expressed some pessimism about um, autonomous vehicles. What if it was autonomous public transportation, for example? Would that get over some of the, perhaps, disparities that we might see manifesting in... Well, one of, the, uh, one of the things about uh, the quest to make autonomous vehicles is it's really a quest to reinvent public transportation. Right? Like, people say, oh, what if we had an autonomous car that would, like, go along and, like, pick people up and take them to common destinations? I'm like, well, it would be a bus. Like, what if we have a truck? <laughs> right? Like, a truck that drives itself over, like, a dedicated truck highway? It's like, well, we have trains. Like, that's a freight train. That's what that is. Uh, so it's not clear to me that we're, uh, that we're coming up with anything that, are, that is a radically new idea. Uh, and I think we do need much more investment in public transportation. Um, but I think about the um, autonomous bus, for example. I, I think about the autonomous school bus, or I think about uh, what would happen if there were no driver on a Greyhound bus or in a New York City bus that I'm riding on. And I realize that uh, the bus driver, for me, serves a really important uh, safety function. So if I'm on a bus, and somebody starts giving me a hard time, I, or there's somebody crazy, or there's somebody who I feel is threatening to me, I can go sit next to the bus driver, and the bus driver will I, adjudicate the situation, or I will just feel safer, because I feel like, oh, if something happened, I'm next to the bus driver. And a lot of people depend on that feeling of safety inside the microenvironment of a bus. And uh, so somebody, uh, somebody asked me, uh, well, what if there were a custodian on the bus? But that custodian does not have the same moral authority as the driver, right? So remember when you were a kid and you would be like messing around in the back of the car and your mom would say, you cut that out or I'm gonna stop the car right now. Like there's something terrifying about, oh my God, what if, what if the car stops? And you feel the same way on a bus. You feel like, oh, if the bus stops, it's kind of a disaster. But also the bus driver, is literally keeping you safe, like they are keeping you from running off the road and dying. So I think we have a lot invested in the social dynamics of uh, public transportation right now. And I think if we take away the bus driver and we take away that kind of moral authority that we've all agreed on, I don't think that's particularly good for our social interactions in public. Wow. In a moment, I'm going to ask the audience for a question, but Laura, I wanted to pose one more to you before we do. Uh, I imagine. So you raised, as I understand it, one of the largest seed rounds for a woman of color founder yeah. ever. Yeah. Uh, and so I imagine you spend a lot of time talking with VCs and like Silicon Valley people yeah. who are playing a pivotal role in designing some of these algorithms that are affecting all of our lives at the moment. Um, what, when you speak to them, what cautions do you give them about how they're approaching AI? Um, and what advice do you give them about how to incorporate humanity into the AIs that they're building? I think AI, and then we go into cryptocurrency, and then we go into virtual reality. So I say three, three spaces where there's not enough representation. And I kindly say, do you, and I will always like in, encourage female founders or even young women your age to try to think of building rather than consuming. Because we don't want a world where AI 
and decentralized currencies and a virtual reality that is b built by the sameness that built us where we are now in this reality, external political reality. So I think, and that was just social media. So we look at 10 or 20 years of who's building these technologies, including AI. And I think it's very interesting to always look at who's building these autonomous vehicles, who are, who's building what we think is good for humanity, but is it at the end of the day at the expense of our humanity? And hence, I do, well, I do worry when I pitch to VCs and I see that they just funded the largest whatever round and my round for, to be honest, in Silicon Valley was not, it was two million. How is it that a woman of color, that was the largest round mm -hmm. um, in Silicon Valley, <laughs> was where my peers, who I love, my founder male peers, are getting two or three times that, um, writing a biased, Technology, so I worry. I worry for my technology, for my industry. I worry for the investments that sometimes are made, and my existence being there and holding account accountable for the AIs that they're because they've built products that were very biased and that played into our bi um, isms um, are really. It's worth some. That being said, I hope that at least by me investing in something that is much more I in inclusive will counter that. Well, this is a very good question. Now we turn to the audience for another good question. I have two rules for my questioners. One, please identify yourself at the outset of your question. And two, please don't give a manifesto, otherwise you'll hear it. You'll feel the heat of a thousand side eyes. So, <laughs> let's see. Thank you. For Thank you for the, uh, the forewarning. Uh, name is Paul Boudre with House Studios. It's a question for the panel. If you could use the power of AI to solve a social or humanitarian problem that's personal to you, you had to pick one, what would it be and why? Katie, why don't you answer that question first? All right, so I've always had this big project in mind, and it really stemmed from the 2013 Boston bombings from the marathon, because at that point, nobody was going outside. Everybody was in their houses. They were watching the news. And I remember seeing these thermal images of one of the bombers inside a boat mm -hmm. in a man's backyard. And I remember thinking, well, maybe that technology could be incorporated into a robot that would be able to go into disaster relief situations and be able to find people and save them rather than sending humans into these dangerous situations where they have to rummage through debris and may not find all the people who are stuck under the debris. So if we could create an autonomous robot that, was, that would be able to save thousands of humans, I think that would be amazing. As a longtime partner of a first responder, thank you for looking out. <laughs> Good looking out. Um, can I answer? I, I actually uh, went, uh, the situation was happening at the border where there were separati separating families. I, as an immigrant, um, was really touching to me. So I thought, how can AI actually help these families come together? So I joined with other uh, technologists, uh, psychologists, doctors, and um, lawyers to actually want to build a chatbot where we can actually send text to the families um, at the home sent, uh, country and make sure that they understand where their families are at when they're seeking refuge at the border. So I think that is definitely a good use of AI and I am proud of it. Mm. I, well, uh, thank you for that question, Paula. And I think we can take one more, if there's someone in the audience that has one. Well, then I'm going to take moderator's prerogative, uh, <laughs> Meredith and Edmund. Um, you heard uh, two uh, examples of, of, of 
technologies or approaches that could be used for AI. Do you hear any cautions or any things that we should keep in mind in either of these? Um, if Katie's uh, emergency finding first responding drone were to be built, what should we think about as we build it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I was, uh, Katie, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, oh, what a good idea. And then I was thinking about the logistics of it. Like, all right, you wouldn't really want it to be a robot on the ground. You'd want it to be a robot, or you want it to be a drone, because you'd want to use it for something like a building collapse to find people who are underneath, uh, underneath debris, so it would need to be flying. Um, but I think that I, when it comes to drones, I, there was a lot of enthusiasm about drones, but then the FAA shut down uh, you know, commercial drone use very quickly and said, all right, listen, we need to uh, get, some, uh, get some rules around this behavior, uh, which I think was appropriate because it's, it's really important to have agreement on how we're going to act around new technology. Uh, so that we don't have social conflict. So I'm not really excited about the idea of delivery drones, but I am excited about the idea of first responder helper drones. Uh, so I feel like this is a conversation we can have as a democracy about you know, what are appropriate uses of technology and what works with our existing values. Why don't we close on that note? Thank Meredith, you. Edmund, Laura, Katie, thank you so much and thanks to all of you. Thank you.